have some bad news. Uh, I have some bad news and I have some good news. Bad news is that unfortunately Jack couldn't make it today as he's uh, pretty busy. Good news is the wonderful Anne-Marie Comfort is here and going to co-discuss with me, which means I get to learn a lot from her. Hey, Anne-Marie, thanks for joining us today. Hey, Charmaine. I am excited to be here, but the learning will all be from, from you to me. So I'm excited to learn from you today. We'll just all learn from each other, which is the beauty of EMR. Um, and we have a wonderful uh, case presenter, uh, and we'll preach. Do you want to say hi to everyone and introduce yourself? So, uh, hi, everyone. A very good morning to all. Uh, my name is Dr. Anmol Preet Kaur, and you can call me Anmol. Uh, I'm from India, and I'm a member of Five Rivers Heart Association since 2021, uh, an association run by Dr. Swayman Singh, an amazing person himself. Uh, and I remember him doing a VMR with you guys as well. And uh, he's uplifted everyone around him. And I really feel lucky that I got to be a part of his association and serve people. But we got to stop right here because the immense respect and admiration I have for him and his family will keep me going on and on. And uh, so again, a very good morning to all. And I'm honored to be here. And thank you so much everyone for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Ravi, sir, if you're there in the attendance. Uh, I'm glad that I'll get to learn from so many uh, big personalities. And uh, I'm really excited, equally excited and nervous for my first ever case presentation. Oh, we're so lucky to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. And we'll, um, we'll get the board up. Um, uh, and thank you to Hemina and David for like doing teaching points and scribing. Uh, so if you get the board up, we can get started. And Marie, do you want to take the first aliqua? Sure, let's do this. Um, and Emil Preet, I'm a little bit nervous to be discussing. So we're just all going to learn and have a great time together. Okay, so that, that's great. We are in the same boat, maybe. But you guys are doing a great job. I mean, explaining every symptom and physical examination in such details. I think it's helping so many physicians across the globe, and it will be helping uh, more. Awesome. So whenever you're ready, I think we okay. got things all up. Okay. So let's start the case discussion. Uh, today, we're going to uh, discuss the case of a lady who presented to the clinic with the chief complaints of increasing epigastric discomfort or fullness, along with vomiting accompanied by nausea for a day. So uh, these are the basic chief complaints of the patient. Um, should I elaborate further or uh, do you want to exercise your brains discussing about the symptoms uh, for the unbiased discussions? Oh, I think we can go from here. Uh, do you have an age or an approximate age range? Yes, she's a middle-aged woman, uh, a 48-year-old lady. Okay. Um, so here we think about a middle-aged female and we hear about increased fullness, nausea, and discomfort in the epigastric area. Um, so I'm definitely thinking about localizing to the abdomen, but I don't want to forget the adjacent organs um, that can sometimes mimic abdominal pathology like the lungs and um, the heart as well. And so I'm going to like also make sure that while I'm thinking about that, I'm not forgetting about those things. Um, Additionally, the age of 48 makes um, something like pregnancy less likely, but I still want to make sure that I'm not missing those etiologies. Um, so when I have abdominal pain, I like to think about it by quadrants. I find that it can be helpful with the caveat of sometimes things don't play by the rules. Um, and so, you know, you still have to think about, or sometimes things are more diffuse and then they localize later in the time course due to the abdominal interventions. So when we think about the epigastric area, I like to think about, you know, what's there in the area. Um, so I'm thinking about the esophagus going into the stomach and the duodenum. And then I'm thinking about the pancreas um, and the biliary tract, which is in the right upper quadrant, but 
draining into it and can sometimes cause the um, epigastric pain. And then also thinking about some of the retroperitoneal um, organs like the aorta um, as well. And so here, you know, I, the first thing I want to think about is like, what are the life-threatening things um, that could be going on here? So doing an abdominal exam, say, do we need to get urgent abdominal imaging? Are we concerned about like a peritonitis, some sort of perforation, some sort of small bowel obstruction or something like that? Um, so I'm definitely going to want to triage, look at the vital signs, look at the abdominal exam, um, do those um, quick metrics. And then I'm just going to, and then um, I'm going to want to get a good history about exposures, abdominal surgeries. Has this happened before? Um, thinking about like what could be going on. So in the stomach, duodenum. Um, so asking, like thinking about gastritis, esophagitis, um, duodenitis, thinking about NSAIDs exposures, anticoagulants, peptic ulcer disease, thinking about pancreatitis. Um, so asking about potential um exposures, um, and then um, asking about symptoms of SBO. So are they passing gas? When was their last bowel movement? What other symptoms is it keeping? Is it keeping fever, um, which could raise the concern for either like one of the itises, like appendicitis or um, cholangitis or pancreatitis or some other sort of infectious thing like a liver abscess? Um, and so asking a really good history, um, doing a really good abdominal exam, and then kind of having the decision point, you know, like how urgent is this? Do we need to go urgently to abdominal um, imaging? Um, and then kind of when I come with like increased abdominal fullness, I'm thinking about organomegaly. I'm thinking about gas um, in the form of obstruction or just like ileus or bloating. I'm thinking about a mass in the form of malignancy. Um, I'm thinking about increased fluid in the form um, of ascites or some sort of um, blood. So those would be some of the first things that I would be thinking on in helping me um, triage this. Um, but I think that the vital signs, the abdominal exam, and the further history are going to go a long way in helping narrow this differential. Charmaine, what do you have? I have absolutely nothing to add, which is my favorite phrase to use. Uh, that was uh, fantastic, Anne-Marie. Uh, and well, do you want to like, give us um, a little bit, maybe take us through the uh, until the physical exam, just being respectful of the time? Okay, uh, so uh, do we shift directly to the physical examination or the history first? Uh, no, just like if you don't mind like, giving us the HBI, the past medical history, and taking us uh, up okay. to the physical exam. Okay, so uh, she's, as I mentioned, a 48 year old woman and presented acutely with vomiting accompanied by loss of appetite and increasing epigastric fullness. So actually the history dates back to September last year. Uh, that it, she was, it was eight months prior to presentation before which she was apparently normal. Uh, in September last year, she presented with similar symptoms of mild intensity for the first time and medications were taken from local pharmacies, which did not provide any relief. She continued her daily routine until uh, like that until in this May 2023, when her symptoms aggravated again. So a mild epigastric pain or discomfort was present, but there was no pain in other regions or quadrants of the abdomen. Uh, she was a febrile and no loose and no history of loose stools. Also, there was no history of blood in the stools as well. And talking about the past medical history, she had migraine for five years and asymptomatic gallstones for 12 years. Also, she was uh, she has hypertension for uh, after the and has no past medical history. Um, she uh, her both parents have of diabetes mellitus and hypertension. Uh, now, since we know about her past medical history. It will be interesting. Uh, she takes a combination for her migraine. So she basically takes an abortive therapy for migraine whenever required. 
And uh, for hypertension, she takes a combination of telmartin 40 mg, hydrochlorothiazide 12.5 mg regularly every day. And then uh, regarding the social history, uh, she's a housewife whose lifestyle at the time of presentation was sedentary because she was advised rest by a physician in uh, mid-2022 due to complaints of coccidinia, that is stale bone pain, and evidence of dorsal lumbar strain on x-ray spine. Also important is that she does not drink alcohol and she does not smoke. She is a pure vegetarian. This was all about the history. Um, I think pretty much it covers everything. Uh, thank you so much for such a thoughtful and thorough presentation. Uh, I can take a stab at this and then pass the mic to Anne Marie to see if she has anything to add. So in terms of like uh, looking at the HPI, it sounds like she had um, another episode similar to this um, many months prior. So the question is like, you know, are these two because of the same pathology or they're just unrelated to each other. Uh, if you, if you, uh, right in the train thought that, oh, they're related to each other, then we're invoking something that is intermittent or uh, uh, like a pathology, like, you know, uh, obstructions, valvulus, um, these things like can happen intermittently. And oftentimes, like if you don't catch it as the episode is happening, you might not. With her nausea, vomiting, it makes me want to definitely uh, investigate obstruction as Anne-Marie mentioned as well. The other things of being common, like peptic ulcer disease are common and they can have different uh, aggravating factors um, uh, as well. Uh, so well, those are the things that kind of like jumps out to me is that, you know, something like, um, increasing gas, that fullness with like a kind of obstruction and valvulus type picture, common etiologies of epigastric pain. She has a history of gallstones. So uh, I'm not sure if these was related to food intake, but that is another, you know, um, another pathology to think about. Again, you know, uh, epigastric is a neighbor to the right upper quadrant. So those things, again, can sometimes present very similarly uh, to each other. Kind of thinking about her past medical history, especially with migraine, you know, um, folks can have abdominal migraine as well. However, in an acute setting, that always remains a, a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, and uh and yeah, as Anne-Marie mentioned, you know, get, doing a physical exam and also vital signs will be really informative. In addition, like, you know, tube of truth might be something we need in this case. Um, again, like acute abdominal pain in an emergency, if you're worried about it, most roads lead to a, some sort of abdominal imaging. Uh, Anne-Marie, anything to add? Thank you. I can't think of anything at the moment. I'm excited to hear more exam and vital signs. Um, so can we move over to the physical examination? Okay, so the most important thing in this case is that at the time of presentation, her weight was 80, 80 kg, which equals to the BMI of 32.9. Uh, and Almost uh, every other vital sign was normal. Blood, uh, blood pressure was 124 by 84. Heart rate was 70 beats per minute. And respiratory rate was 19 breaths per minute. Although uh, in general physical examination, I might mention that she was breathing a little, um, there was a mild distress while she was breathing, but her respiratory rate was 19 breaths per minute and her saturation was 97% on room air. And uh, the more the, the general physical examination was that the general appearance was that she was uncomfortable and a visible mild distress while breathing. There was no evidence of icterus in the eyes. And uh, the most important examination is that palpable hepatomegaly was present. There was no right upper quadrant tenderness and no tenderness anywhere else in the abdomen. Rest of the physical examination was within normal limits. There was no uh, pedal edema and there were uh, the peripheral pulses were palpable. Uh, so this was about the physical examination uh, and moving towards the labs and imaging. Uh, so the labs were her uh, HP was 12.6. 
and uh, her uh, WBC count was 8,600, again, within normal limits. But the interesting point here is her differential leukocyte count. Her differential leukocyte count says that her neutrophils were on the lower side with 38.3% and lymphocytes were 52%. Uh, the rest of the monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils were, again, within normal ranges. Then uh, the platelets uh, were 3,12,000 per microliter. Again, normal. Talking about her HbA1c, it was 6.50, and her fasting blood sugar was 119. Uh, very important to discuss since she had no past history of diabetes mellitus. Then uh, talking about her total cholesterol levels, it was 207 uh, mg per deciliter. LDL cholesterol was 145 mg per deciliter. And triglycerides uh, were 135, that is normal. And HDL cholesterol was 49.4, again, that is normal. Uh, AST was 83.60. ALT was 158.60 and GGT was 30. So AST and ALT are increased, but GGT is normal. Uh, then serum uric acid was 6.5. Uh, so uh, the rest of the labs were almost, uh, they were all normal. And uh, the increased AST and ALT, in fact, points towards a hepatocellular pattern. Uh, of the liver injury. Sharmeen, do you want me to take the vital signs and exam, and then um, I can let you discuss the labs? Um, so just thinking about the vital signs, um, in some ways they're reassuring, um, but in some ways, you know, we don't see fever, we don't see like significant tachycardia, but hearing that she's breathing a little bit fast and seems to be in some distress, like I'm not completely reassured, especially in a younger patient that can compensate more so. So I'm still going into this like concerned. And just because we don't see a fever at this time point doesn't mean there hasn't been a fever um, there. And so while I get some reassurance, I'm definitely still going to want to do a thorough investigation um, and think about everything. So there's not a lot on this exam, but I think there is some helpful information. The fact that there is um, not scleral icterus, um, usually if the bilirubin is above about three, um, you can see it in the eyes. Um, about 2.5, you can see it sublingually above the tongue. So it makes me think if I didn't have the labs that there's not a really high bilirubin level. Um, the palpable yeah, hepatosis. So um, the palpable um, hepatomegaly um, it makes me wonder about what's going on there. Um, is there some sort of infiltrative process? Is there increased fluid there? Um, is there some sort of an early liver disease? Oftentimes you get hepatomegaly before you get cirrhosis. So some sort of NASH, um, some sort of other liver disease in the background. Um, and so going back to prior imaging, if you have it to see if that's present before, um, or is there something acute, like is an acute viral hepatitis? Um, so I'd be thinking about both the common causes of viral hepatitis um, and the less common causes like CMV, um, EBV that can sometimes cause these symptoms, HIV. So thinking about your full, all your hepatitis as well. And then also thinking about like abscess. So thinking about a hepatic abscess, which could also cause hepatomegaly um, as well as like your parasitic um, that could cause hepatomegaly um, as well would be kind of some of the initial things that I would be thinking out, but I'd be looking at the labs to help narrow that. Um, notably, I'm not seeing on exam things like edema or stigmata, other stigmata of liver disease that makes me think that there's advanced decompensated cirrhosis or heart failure present. Um, Charmaine, what, what uh, can we make of the labs and what progress can we make there? 
Yeah, quite fascinating. I'm not sure what is going on, but I'm excited to delve deeper into them. So I, lo I love that about a megaly approach as well. So I obviously think whether it's like mass or diffuse and whether that's like water infiltrative or like in uh, inflammation. And we have some signal for inflammation with like elevated leukocytosis that is lymphocytic predominance. You know, oftentimes with our most like acute pyogenic bacterial, we think about um, neutrophilic. So the lymphocytic predominance, you you know, makes you think about uh, some infections in addition to like malignancy or other like autoimmune diseases that can at times present with like lymphocytic uh, predominance. You know, we get a little bit of a signal with the ASC ALT that are mildly elevated for a liver injury. What I would say about like any labs are, um, any labs just gives you the, uh, a picture and that moment in time when the labs were drawn, like ASC, ALT have like different life uh, half life. So sometimes how these things trend are equally as important. Um, also, I've been quite humble in general with like gallbladder disease. That you know, gallbladder is a neighbor of the liver. I've seen gallbladder pathology present with really abnormal liver chemistry is no abnormal liver chemistry at all. So again, it's just a point in data. But if you think about, you know, ASCALT being uh, elevated with the hepatomegaly, are we seeing, um, are we should be thinking about any infiltrative causes um, of liver uh, injury? The other thing that I just want to mention, you know, with the hemoglobin A1C that is like slightly elevated, in addition to, you know, uh, uh, obesity, like, uh, we're getting a little bit of like a metabolic syndrome and thinking about, you know, epigastric pain, whether like this hepatomegaly is, it could be a red herring. And we should think about like something like uh, uh, myocardial infarction, which is a normal misdiagnosis, especially like an RCA infarct, inferior infarct. So I would definitely get a trip and ECG just to be on the safe side. Most likely um, it's just your no misdiagnosis. So that's not, that's something you don't want to miss. Uh, the other thing to think about are, you know, with, uh, uh, with like the diabetes and infiltrative uh, diseases, uh, given like her age, uh, should we think about like, you know, uh, Wilson's or other ideologies as well. Uh, so I think the differential is really, but I love that. And Marie, you started thinking about hepa, hep, uh, uh, hepatitis disease. I think that is definitely setting up her like abdominal symptoms, a good thing to rule out. The other things that I would consider, you know, getting in baseline HIV um, is always helpful. Um, and also like uh, just thinking about more like infiltrative causes and then at the end uh thinking about malignancy as well anything else and marie to add to that no this is this is awesome all right can't wait to hear more okay uh so can i discuss about the uh imaging that is ultrasound abdomen uh, so on ultrasound abdomen, the liver was enlarged in size and it measured approximately 17 centimeter. So it was homogeneously echogenic with fatty infiltration. And uh, because of the uh, chronic polycystitis, the gallbladder was distended as well and showed a calculus measuring approximately 15 mm floating within. Um, do you do you um, know if the um, common bile duct diameter was seen on the ultrasound? Um, I think uh, this was the main uh, representation, which was the result of the ultrasound. I might check. I, I don't think a CBD diameter was uh, really that because uh, these were the main results, which were um, the uh, the result of that USG abdomen, uh, rest everything was normal. Even if it was visualized, it was normal. Um, sure, I mean, I think I need to get ready to go. So, um, but I look forward to hearing about the rest of this case. Thanks for joining us, Anne-Marie. You're the best. <laughs> All right. Um, I, uh, just to, uh, in terms of time, any other studies, uh, Emma, before the final diagnosis?
it was um, um, mostly the labs and the history is uh, just points uh, towards it. And the fact that she's obese, gotcha. uh, I think the main points I feel that. Uh, the All right, perfect. So yeah, in terms of like the ultrasound finding with the hepatomegaly, you know, the, uh, the another day, Diagnosis of, again, like, I think exclusion here would be like a, a NASH, um, you know, given her a metabolic profile, her obesity, the other things to think about, you know, uh, that are kind of less likely, like hemochromatosis that can present within the onset of diabetes. However, that's less likely, um, yeah, uh, most likely, you know, setting up metabolic syndrome. Um, she has like type 2 diabetes um, give, uh, and a high risk of insulin resistance. Uh, so, uh, and in terms of like that distended uh, gallbladder, if you don't really see a CBD doc dilatation, the question is like, you know, could she have, oh, could she have passed a stone? Um, you know, a passed stone could have uh, caused nausea, vomiting, epigastric abdominal pain, and ASC elevate, uh, ASCLT elevation that now is like on downtrending uh, because the stone is passed. That is another um, another thing to consider. But I think like when it comes to like hepatomegaly, the other things that I would want to know, I'm not sure like if Dalbers were done, like any vessel occlusions uh, uh, that can re uh, can lead to hepatomegaly. Um, it doesn't seem like she had any ascites or anything. Um, and I don't see a splenomegaly, just the hepatomegaly um, here. Um, so I think in general, I'm like the most concerned for NASH, but I would still want to make sure, you know, give in her lymphocytic predominance died. Uh, we have uh, worked up of our hepatitis infections, EBV, same the usual culprits uh, that can cause um, that type of a lymphocytic pattern as well. Um, and go from there. Uh, uh, all right, and Mal, do you want to teach us? Okay, so I just got hold of the report in my phone. Uh, it is basically uh, the additional things which were within normal limits. Uh, they state that the intrahepatic biliary reticles are normal um, and not dilated. And, and the CBD and portal vein, they are normal in caliber, measuring approximately 3 and 10 mm respectively. So, uh, and there is no calculus seen in the visualized part of the CBD. And uh, the gallbladder wall appears slightly thickened and mildly echogenic and no pericholecystic fluid collection seen. Uh, so this was about the ultrasound uh, reports. And uh, this according, uh, this actually was main a case of a metabolic syndrome, uh, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We can see that she does not uh, drink alcohol and she's actually an obese person whose lifestyle was sedentary. Um, when she presented with these symptoms last uh, the eight months ago, and uh, while the examination eight months ago, also uh, we, uh, we could palpate her liver. Her liver was enlarged on the physical examination. And um, she kept on following the same routine. Her sedentary lifestyle continued. And then ultimately she just presented with the increasing epigastric fullness. Uh, so that was basically uh, total symptomatology of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is very, very common in uh, India. Uh, and uh, um, it is a part of metabolic syndrome. And since she was not diabetic before, uh, she uh, also now has evidence of diabetes and insulin resistance, which is also a part of the metabolic syndrome. Um, and along with that, uh, we can see that AST and ALT are elevated. So this, this points towards hepatocellular pattern and GGT is normal. So we cannot say it's cholestatic. Uh, so it mainly points towards hepatocellular. And uh, uh, the main, actually, uh, these symptoms were in May 2023. And now we know about the progress of the disease, because uh, she was uh, prescribed some statins, but she has mainly healed with exercise. Now she exercises daily two hours, two hours a day. And we can see the improvement in her symptoms. Uh, and the mainstay of treatment in uh, MAFLD or metabolic syndrome is uh, 
is exercise only, which can even uh, reverse the fatty infiltration of the liver. So uh, this was actually a case of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I love this case. Thank you so much, Anmol, for presenting. As you mentioned, a NASH is something that we see quite often. And this is oftentimes is like more, as you mentioned, just like subacute to chronic background of it that, you know, at one point they might present uh, acutely to um, to uh, emergency rooms and for evaluation as this, this patient this one time. And uh, I love thinking through this case with you. Thank you so much for all the wonderful teaching. And I'm so glad to hear the patient is doing better. And I think the nice thing about metabolic syndrome, if we're lucky enough to have the resources and the abilities is that, you know, with the diabetes, especially type two, they have really good medications um, with increase in exercise. These things can be controlled. And I love the yeah, as is a uh, point as a coffee lover is that coffee intake more than two cups uh, per day in patients with pre-existing liver disease has been shown to be associated with lower incidence of fibrosis. That just, I use that as an excuse to drink more coffee. <laughs> uh, so thanks for that little nugget, Yaz. Uh, but thank you so much for presenting. Uh, any thoughts about the, uh, the leukocytosis that she had on presentation, uh, Admiral? Have we have were you guys thinking about that? So she didn't have okay. So she didn't have leukocytosis. Oh, Her WBC count is normal. Oh uh, the only uh, the only uh, thing we the uh, only concern was her differential leukocyte count where we could see lymphocytic predominance. Um, so that could point to various things. It could point to autoimmune malignancy, but it is also seen in chronic conditions as well, subacute conditions. So uh, we can maybe uh, understand that it could be due to some underlying inflammation, which was uh, happening over a long time since it is a eight month case uh, presentation. So that could be one answer to this situation because I can say that with conviction, with slight conviction, because I have seen multiple cases of similar cases of NAFLD where there was lymphocytic predominance. And even their cholesterol levels were also high. She had a, a slightly elevated total cholesterol levels. So she was slightly better from those. But in those cases as well, uh, I observed lymphocytic predominance. Wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, sharing uh, uh, sharing your experience. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Uh, thanks all for joining us. Um, I'm so excited for Jimena to do Teaching Points. Uh, uh, take it away, my friends. I'm sorry. I just had so many windows open that I just couldn't find a Zoom. <laughs> to no worries. <laughs> no worries at all. Take it away. Okay. So uh, we had a 40 year old female uh, patient who presented to the ED with epigastric discomfort and nausea. She was discovered to have a palpable hepatomegaly and some abnormal transaminases. So she got a US uh, or ultrasound and she uh, was discovered to have. Um, non-alcoholic fatal liver disease, probably to, due to metabolic syndrome. And with this case, uh, we learned that uh, with the main chief complaint, first of all, we tend to localize the pathology, which is good, but we don't have to forget the adjacent organs that can be involved in the process. Uh, when we think about epigastric pain, we need to remember that it can be, it can involve the esophagus, the stomach, the pancreas, the biliary tract, or even retroperitoneal organs like the aorta. And when we have uh, these types of presentations in the ED, another thing that we have to think about is to rule out life-threatening pathologies. Um, and after we do that, we can just comfortably keep uh, getting more information about the patient. And uh, some of that information it's important to get is the medications that they're taking, if they have had any surgeries or they ha are known to have any other um, pathology as a base. And um, 
Another thing that can help us guide a diagnosis is to determine the chronicity and the frequency of the presenting symptoms. Like in this case, the, the pain was intermittent. So that was another clue that we can have to get the diagnosis. Um, and particularly with this case, this patient also had a migraine uh, past medical history. So we could also be considering abdominal migraine, even if it's an exclusion diagnosis. Uh, that's something that has to be on our minds. Um, also, when we moved on to the physical exam and we're able to palpate the liver, we can start thinking about liver diseases per se, if the patient has congestion or is an infiltration process like a mass or other acute pathologies um, like viruses that would cause inflammation or even abscesses. When we have lymphocytic predominance that also can orient us to think about more of malignancies, autoimmune diseases and infectious diseases, specifically the viruses. And um, this is also related to one of the points that you guys talked at the beginning of the discussion, which is that this patient has risk factors to have cardiac disease. So it's always good to check the ECG and the troponin, just in case this isn't a typical presentation of MI, especially because uh, this patient is a female and it had a uh, mild respiratory distress. And when, uh, we have a patient that's older and that is being discovered or it's newly discovered diabetes. We can also think about hemochromatosis and NASH, even though they're less common pathologies. Boom, Hamana, thank you so much. I'm also so impressed with you all that you can do like teaching points as we pick up the teaching point as we are discussing. That's like such a hard skill. And thank you so much for uh, organizing it and uh, summarizing it so well. Uh, and thanks, a big shout out to David for scribing. You're awesome. And well, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for presenting the case. We hope to see you more often here. Uh, and thanks all for joining. Um, we'll see you tomorrow. It Bye. was my pleasure. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Oh my gosh, uh, absolutely our pleasure. Can't wait for next time. Bye, all.